And I think it's so easy for us to call ourselves hacks and to beat ourselves up emotionally when we're out there running and trying the best we can. And it, it does our, it does a huge disservice to our, who we are as people and as runners. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by Runners Connect. So whether you're doing chores, relaxing on the couch, or probably out running, I know there's plenty of other ways you could be spending your time. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank you so much for choosing to spend it with Run to the Top. I truly appreciate it. So last week we heard from Molly Huddle, who told us all about her New York marathon training and what it was like finishing sixth in the Olympics with an American record. If you missed it, uh, Molly is such a sweetheart and you're not going to believe that such a kind and genuine person could be such a badass in races. There are certain people in the running world whose names you see over and over again, and Molly is definitely one of them, but usually because she's winning just about every road race there is. Um, But there's also some community members who are just so passionate about running that they get our attention for other reasons. So today we have one of the kings of those running influencers on the podcast, uh, Chris Heusler, a.k.a. Run Weston. Chris has a runner's dream job, and you can see why he was, is selected from thousands of applicants during this interview. He shares what he does, how he can help you feel at more at ease in your next race, and best of all, why he was the first banana to cross the finish line of a marathon to win him a year's free Jamba juice. Do you think you would run in a banana suit in a marathon to win a year's free Jamba? I think I'd probably would actually. Anyway, I'll get on with the interview after a word from our wonderful sponsors. Running is tiring, we know that, but the accumulation of miles is what really gets us, leaving us sore and exhausted. I take Body Health Perfect Amino Tablets to improve recovery, and you should too. You will notice a difference and you can learn more at bodyhealth.com. This podcast is brought to you by Socony. For those of you who have not heard of this brand, they're the best, really. I don't just wear Saucony for every run, but they also have a great collection of casual clothes for everyday use, which I live in. Use coupon code TINA for 10% off your next order. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Chris. Thank you, Tina. I'm excited to hear more about you. I've seen so much about you in the the running world and the social media world, so this is going to be fun, I think. And uh, for those of you who don't know you, you are the Run Western Concierge. And I'm sure most people who don't know you are probably thinking, what the heck does that mean? So Mm -hmm. firstly, let's go on and tell us what that means. (laughs) I think, well, for for starters, you say it much better than most, Tina. Okay. Uh, Concierge is really the the pronunciation. You just, you nailed it. I I say concierge and just doesn't have the ring to it. Mm. Um, (laughs) The job uh, is constantly evolving. Um, When I was hired, there were already 30 run concierges around the U.S. And they were full-time employees at their respective properties. And about twice a week, they would lead guests on a three-mile private running tour around that city. To enhance that role, they did this national search for someone who would, who would help oversee that program, help it grow, and then additionally sort of uh, help expand our partnership with the Rock and Roll Marathon Series. So it's so, Weston is... Uh sponsored by uh rock and roll rock and roll sponsors which way around is we're it? partners so okay. western okay. is the preferred partner hotel okay. of the rock and roll marathon series okay. so anytime there is a western in a market where there's a rock and roll race more than likely i will be there <laughs> okay. and i fly in a day or two early to really run the course in the same way a concierge tastes menus and goes to different restaurants i don't want to just look at a map i want to feel it Mm-hmm. I want to see what 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 tips I can offer runners on property. I want to be sort of be like the on-site running coach uh, for these runners who are coming in to run the race. Okay. And then additionally, it really helped the run concierge program grow on a global and national level. So now we're up to 200 run concierges around the world, wow. which is fantastic. And Weston is known as a very strong wellness brand. 
So how can we really practice what we preach? So keeping my eyes on the trends of fitness and weighing in when I, when they ask. Okay. So then when you said you really want to go get a feel for it, um, so you fly in, you know, a day early or so. So you, I take it you go for a run like from the hotel in the local area and uh, do you test out, you know, local pasta restaurants? What kind of things does this involve? Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, I will definitely run the rock and roll course itself. Okay. So I will go to the start line. I'll run the, third, the half marathon at the full. And I, if I can, I try to take a local or two with me to give me more tips about what that building is or what that mountain is and really understand the course. And for the most part, I've been very impressed with the layouts of rock and roll courses, more so than I did. You know, I've been running for 20 years, and I think I just took it for granted that races run the way they do. There's a science to it. Alan Culpepper did most of their courses, designed them. That's an art to design a really smart course. And I think some of them are fantastic. I think some need to be worked on. But they're like the Montreal course this past weekend is a brilliant course. It's a really smart half marathon. Mm -hmm. And the only way to really see that is to feel it. So that's why I run them. And what else do you do in the area? Like you said, I'll try to find out like the cool little local coffee shops, um, local running stores. I really like to give support local business when I can and tell our guests to go there. And hey, you know, the owner ran a 225 marathon 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. She's a really good person, whatever it is. Understand the, the, the best local spots that take care of runners. Okay. Okay. And so, so when people arrive, you know, they, they've signed up to stay in the hotel. Do you kind of, um, stay in the lobby area for most of the day before to kind of, as people arrive, you know, see what they need running wise? What does it involve? Exactly. So I have my own little run concierge desk <laughs> and, I'll, and the day before uh, I, the, with the TV behind me that plays the rock and roll video. And like you said, I'm, I'm sort of the analogy is I, I think runners are like brides on their wedding weekends. <laughs> they are anxious, they're needy and they want attention. So my job is to give them all three <laughs> and to really keep their stress levels down. Okay, and then what about when it comes to the race day itself? What do you, do you race it every time, or do you does it depend on the race, or how how does that go about? I, I don't think I do my my job as well if I race it. Mm -hmm. um, you're competitive, I know you are, <laughs> and if your job is to make sure that people's stress levels stay down, but you're also trying to race, yeah, it just can't be that as hospitable as I'd like to. Mm -hmm. So I like to hold their hand a little bit make sure they get to the start line and keep their heart rate down, uh, help them not sweat the small stuff. It's, it, I've noticed that the one to two hours before a race is the hardest time to please a runner mm -hmm. because that is the precise moment when they are completely out of their routine. They're not home. They are about to do their race or their long run, whatever you want to call it, and nothing is the same. Yeah. Their coffee might be different. The bagel's not toasted the right way. They had to walk farther than they thought to get to the start. Everything's different. Mm -hmm. So the more I can just manage the expectation of the runner in that regard, hopefully the better I can do. Okay. The flip side is after the race, no matter what you do, it's right. It's perfect because they're like on cloud nine endorphin world. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I'm sorry I cursed you out earlier. I was just emotional. Yeah, it's okay. You know, it's fine. It happens all the time. Um, so it's really a fun roller coaster ride the day of. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can only imagine, and especially as so many, uh, we all kind of have our own way of handling it. You know, some people like to uh, be completely in a world of their own, not talk to anyone, be very silent. Some people, you know, if you think of like Usain Bolt or Mo Farah, uh, Mo Farah they're both very like chill and relax. And yeah. I remember when I was at the um, World Half Marathon um, Championships and I was sitting there with Mo in the room, which I was kind of starstruck, yeah. but he was just, he was talking about the football, the, the soccer, the football that had gone on the day before. And he was just, you know, talking about it with the other guys. And I was just looking at him like, you are racing soon. And yeah. you're just talking about, you know, football or something. He was just so chilled. And I thought at that moment, it kind of made me realize like, you don't have to be like, you know, tunnel vision before, Correct. but it, it depends on the person. So that's good that you're there to kind of, um, show them the ropes. And how many people are we talking about here? You know, it's different with every race. Um, it could be as small as 15 and it could it, literally from the property and it could be as much as 50 to 60 per property, okay. uh, per race. But it's, every race is a little bit different and 
uh, it's fun. You really get it's. I consider it a privilege. Yeah. To really be with these individuals on the most sensitive moment, um, particularly the the finish line is is what has taught me the most as a runner. Yeah. Uh, going into the job three years ago, I always and I still have the utmost respect for those really fast half marathoners and marathoners. I, I do. But what the job has taught me, because I'm now forced to stay at the finish line for longer than I used to, is that it's that two and a half hour half marathoner or five hour marathoner that they're just running for something more. Mm -hmm. It's not about a time. It's about a bucket list. And it's really hard to watch that individual cross the finish line without getting choked up a little bit yourself. And you don't know what their reason is. You don't know what their why is. So you have to sort of guess or just observe it. and. It's really opened my eyes to everybody's a runner, no matter what your time, no matter what your goal was. We all, we all line up on the same start line. We all ran to the same finish line. But everybody has a different reason to be there. And as a result, everybody throws a high five and a hug. Oh, I love that. And that's so true. And it is, and it is amazing. If you, you could just take 15 different people and each person has their own reason for running, their own story, their own you know, journey of where they've come, where they've got to go, where they want to go. And it's, it is amazing to think about, like, like you said it, you know, you have the respect for the, the fastest people out there and, you know, they, they're the ones that tend to get the attention, but at the same time, it doesn't take, it shouldn't take anything away from everyone else who's still out there on their own journey. So, um, you know, that's wonderful to hear. And, um, do you have a, maybe a favorite story or favorite moment you could share with us? Oh, if... I was hoping you weren't going to ask this. I, I, I rarely get through this one and I'll <laughs> try. Um, in Chicago. So one of the evolutions of the job is I sometimes get to announce the races, okay. uh, for rock and roll. And in Chicago, rock and roll two years ago, I was at the finish line stage and this guy comes up to me. We're, we're now probably two and a half hours into the, to the mm -hmm. race. Um, and he says, Hey, can you call my, my sister-in-law's name at the finish line? And we get these requests a fair amount. Yeah. Yeah, I can try to. It's kind of busy. You know, it's tough to see them coming in. What's her number? And he gave me her bid number. Does she have a, a story or anything? He's like, yeah. Um, you know, she's a teacher here in Chicago. I was like, oh, that's great. You know, that's really, I, my wife was a teacher and cool. I, I, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, and she, um, she just had her first chemo treatment two days ago. Wow. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. And he's like, and this is our first half marathon. So she, she refused to not, not do this despite the fact that she feels like crap. So we just want to be there for her and can you call her name? Well, the other announcer I was with was a cancer survivor. So I turned to Cree Kelly. I was like, Cree, this is not my call to make. You know, I, I'm not calling her name. You, you're the cancer survivor. You should have the honor. And I looked at the brother. I was like, we're not just calling her name. Like we're going to, we're going to shower this woman with love. So I went down to the finish line. We got all these volunteers together and a lot of fans. And Aww. about 30 minutes later, she's coming through. And um, we made this gigantic tunnel of love for her that was about 50 meters long. And there was not a dry eye in the house. And Aww. she's going through this tunnel. And they're calling her name. And her husband and her daughter are waiting for her at the end. And Oh, wow. There was a, uh, yeah. I bet that was an amazing moment. And you probably changed her life the way she thought about running and just her life in general. It's just, uh, you know, what it brings. And, and uh, again, that's the best representation of our community and just how special it really is. Mm. So I'll well, thank you for sharing that. Oh, yeah. All right. Here's another question for you, which you're probably going to hate. Uh, favorite rock and roll? Um, they're all different. So each one does as a, it's almost like saying what's your favorite type of pizza, pizza. Oh, yeah. hey, there you go I, well, we didn't you know, even plan that it's just, it's just different um so it depends what you're looking for and okay. i get that question all the time so if you're looking for pr i would say you go to philly or san jose if you're looking for the culture i would say you go to something like nashville if you're looking for a party you go to vegas um if you're looking for a really nice strong course that's hard that's going to challenge you you go to san francisco they they all offer something very different um, so it's, it really does boil down to what are, what's your expectation of the race? What are you trying to get out of it? Mm -hmm. And then is there, you might, this might have the same answer again, but if someone was going to do their first rock and roll event, is there any that in particular jump out to you? Um, I really do think Nashville is pretty awesome. Okay. That, that's a great town. It's on a Saturday. 
And I think Saturday races allow you to really enjoy the city better. Mm -hmm. Um, Sundays you race and you got to go back to work the next day. And that kind of stinks and it's underrated and it's overlooked. I think Seattle's also on a Saturday, the Rock and Roll Seattle race. I, I, if I'm a first time runner, you get in there Friday, you race Saturday and you have a full, just about 48 hours to really enjoy that medal Mm -hmm. and what you just put yourself through. Okay. That's great. All right. Um, and then what would you say, um, if someone wanted to, you know, uh, do what the, what we were talking about earlier with you and your job and kind of they, you know, they uh, stayed at the West End, they wanted to join up. Is it anyone can kind of come and meet you or is that something you sign up for before? Yeah, we have a shakeout run the day before every race okay. around 9 a.m. in most markets. OK. And, you know, this past week we had 10 people come down to Montreal, the lobby in Montreal and take them for a nice little tour around. It's okay. very laid back just to shake out the legs. OK. That's typically the situation. Okay. And do you and otherwise, find... I mean, just tell them to reach out. I, I, I get emails all the time, and I love hearing from runners. All right. So then while we're here right now, what's what's your uh, Twitter or Facebook, the oh, best boy. way to reach well, you? Well, Twitter is at Ron Weston. That's mm-hmm. probably the easiest Run Weston. Okay. Yeah. Instagram is my last my, – my, my name, my last name. <laughs> There's way too many vowels in it, so I'm not going to bore your audience with that. I'll so. put links in the show notes. <laughs> so for the time being, I would say Twitter at Ron Weston is probably the best way to connect. Okay. All right. Cool. And and uh, of these run rock and roll uh, races, there are how many? Would you say there's a big percentage of people that go around and do them all? Is this something you would recommend for people as well, like doing trying to get everyone in one season, or is that usually a bit too much? It's a great question, and a teach their own. They they have a huge amount of these tour pass holders that do upwards of five, ten, fifteen a year. I don't know about you. I mean, you you said you've run four marathons. Mm-hmm. And if you look where the elites do, they probably do one a year. Mm-hmm. And that's very telling. I, I don't think it's good for the body to race more than three, four half marathons a year and mm-hmm. one full. Mm-hmm. If you're going to just run it as a training run and you want to see a new city, by all means, go right ahead. But if you're running four or five, ten races a year and expecting to PR in every one of them, mm-hmm. I would highly suggest you reevaluate the way you're approaching your racing. Okay. Great advice there. Very helpful. All right. So let's go back to kind of basics with this uh, job. We know you've told us quite a lot about what you do and, you know, you've become a huge part of the running community through what, you know, what you do on race day, but also what you do outside of it. Um, So do you want to maybe share with us, um, you know, I know your story, but I know a lot of our listeners probably don't of how, Starwood Hotels, how that came about with your job and uh, how you you made your video and tell us sure. about that hiring yeah. process. No, of course. Um, my wife saw the posting on Facebook uh, with, I think, like three or four days left in the application process. What was that for? Uh, so Starwood put out this national search for what they call the runner's dream job. Um, it was very sort of abstract, though. It wasn't that descriptive in what it entailed, just a lot of traveling to races and working with runners. And at the time, I was a full-time running coach with Equinox Gyms. So I liked my job here in Boston, and, and she suggested I apply. And I majored in public relations, and I thought it was this PR stint. I thought they had some you know, celebrity runner already hired that just wanted to get some buzz. So she pushed me to, to apply, and I did thought nothing of it. And then a week later, I get this email saying, you know, you've been narrowed down from 1,100 people to the top 10. And I'm like, holy crap. (laughs) Like, okay, now what? And I had four days to then make a video that would demonstrate why I was right for the job. I was an actor for eight, seven to eight years Mm -hmm. in LA and New York. So I actually had background in editing and working in camera. So I was like, oh, I have that going for me. And then the last thing, on the fourth day that the video was due, I was running the Vermont Mad Marathon. So I figured how many of the 10 applicants are actually going to run a marathon within the four days that this mm-hmm. video is due? So I decided to script this video a little bit and revolve it around the marathon because I'm trying to show that I practice what I preach. I actually am. I could be a run concierge because I do it. So I made a video, sent it in after the Vermont Marathon, proud of the video, and then I get an email saying, you've been narrowed down to the top five. Okay. So then the five of us go to Stanford. We didn't meet each other then. And then we had interviews with like this big board with the vice president of Weston and their head of PR, my eventual boss. And then from there, they narrowed it down to three. And they sent the three of us to Chicago. And I met the other two candidates. They were both wonderful people. 
one specialty struck me as a nutritionist and one struck me as more of a, a very strong social media force. And what was your strength then at that point? I think running. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was it. And I, I told my Rachel, my wife, this that after the first day of getting to know the other candidates a little bit, that if they went the route of a nutritionist, they have her. Mm -hmm. And if they went the route of a social media expert, they have her. If they want a running expert, I think I, I got it. Um, and that was my, that was sort of my mentality. Mm -hmm. And each, each one of us had a strength. And, and then at the end of the day, they offered me the job. And it was originally a six month temporary job. I have two kids. And when they offered it to me, I said, Can, is this going to be full time? Like, I don't want some half a year gig. Like, mm -hmm. is this going to go on? And they couldn't promise me anything. It was just protecting themselves. And then about four months in, they made it full time because of the reception from the running community was so positive. Wow, that's great. Talk about Good making events. an impact immediately. Yeah. But yeah. It was intense. I mean, it was, it was a war. I, I, like, as I was an actor, I went through my fair share of auditions and was, this was a lot different. Mm hmm. And and it's kind of funny that they flew you all over the place as well. Like that's kind of you got like your tester into the job. They probably wanted <laughs> yeah. to see how you handled it as well yeah. with traveling and you know the um, the stress. Kind of sim probably quite similar to getting nervous before a race, right? A little bit. Yeah, it was a little. Um, I so one thing I did do, which was a bit intentional, but also I figured it was part of the job, but it wasn't under the description. Was when we got to Chicago. Uh, the morning we had a breakfast at like 8 a.m. the next day for our first meet and greet. And I went out and I ran the course. At I woke up at 5.30 and I ran the Rock and Roll Chicago half marathon course. And I did it because I figured the other two candidates would not do that. Mm -hmm. And also I thought it would it's part of the job. So if it came up in the interviews during that day with, with Weston, I could talk specifically about what kind of information I would be giving the runners at the Weston. It was, a, I thought, a very organic way of saying this is what this job should be. Yeah. And it resonated. And do you know now whether, did they have an idea of what they wanted exactly or was it kind of they were making it up as they went along and kind of saw in you like, oh, actually, that is good. And <laughs> did were you kind I, I of write in your own script? It has been since we, it's a collective we. We have a really good team. This mm -hmm. is not me writing my own script. Um what they were shocked by was how many people applied. Oh, really? They, they thought 300 people would apply. <laughs> and it was 1,100. And I think they were also shocked by the caliber of people. I mean, like I said, the other two candidates are, are, are phenomenal people. And mm -hmm. it was, I didn't meet the other 10, uh, the finalists, but there, I've, I've also met many people in the past three years who applied for this job. Mm -hmm. They will come up to me on races <laughs> and say, I applied for that job. You stole my job. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I'm, you know, I'm always like, well, uh, sorry, I'm not sorry. I mean, I love what I do, um, <laughs> but they're good people. I mean, yeah. runners are just good oh, people. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. it's, it's, it's a absolute privilege of a job to have. And, and I, I still think we're just getting the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. And what is it? Um, when do you think it was that Weston kind of grasped how important it was to like stay active while traveling this like tie between traveling to hotels and, you know, looking after your body when, you know, you think of most people who travel all the time for work, they go out to eat at, you know, nine o'clock at night and have appetizers, at, you know, six times of appetizers and six beers and then they um you know they go to their next spot and they do the same thing and they end up very overweight they never exercise because they're always away from home when did weston kind of put this together and do you think they're going to keep moving forward making this better and better they did it well before me mm -hmm. um i was not the catalyst by any sense of imagination um i would say probably about seven years ago when run weston was starting to launch they made a specific effort to gear a lot of their efforts towards not just runners, but like you said, that traveler, because some, we had so many consultants who were staying with us Monday through Thursday. So how can we help them stay healthy on the road? Um, that was a, an insight of one of our higher ups that this is our brand. This is what we stand for. And they were ahead of their time mm -hmm. because now you see other hotels trying to catch up. So I think it's the next step for us is to not just help the travelers do it. I think even more important is to really make sure that we, our own associates are practicing wellness to some degree. You don't have to be a runner. Maybe you're really an expert in yoga or you have a really good diet or you sleep really well, or you're good at meditation. But the more our, our associates that when you check in, you get the essence of a health minded hotel. Mm -hmm. Nope. That's good. 
And then are there any other like tips or tricks that you can share with us that um, hotel concierges or maybe just hotels in general, you know, might know about that we may not think to ask? Like, for example, I know I've gone to um, locations where I have, you know, obviously had to do a run the next morning, but I've thought, oh, I'll just figure it out. But maybe I should have asked the hotel because they would probably know the local parks. What other things would you say um, based on your experience that people can actually ask the the hotel themselves? I mean, obviously, dependent on the hotel, like a tiny little dinky motel may not know, (laughs) you know, in West Virginia may not know. But for the most part, what would you say? I think, I mean, every Western has its own map, a three to five mile running loop. So that's the first place I would start at a Western is to say, can I see the map? Um, and they will give it to you. And They'll think, know what you're talking about no matter what Western you're in. It is in every front desk associate's opening their desk. It's right okay. there. Okay. Um, the properties where we have a run concierge, to your point exactly, is I want them to know alternate routes. So if we have someone like you come in who's, I got 15 to run. This is a five, I don't want to do three of these five-mile routes. I'll drive 10 to 15 minutes to get to the best route possible. Um, our run concierge can give you that type of information. Great. So maybe you do a little bit of homework and you, and you find out if that property has a run concierge. And by, like, this could be a Twitter question for me. I get people through Twitter saying, hey, I need uh, advice on a, a run in Memphis. Well, even if we don't have a running concierge down there, I can do some of my due diligence and I can look up a map or connect you with someone down there. There's also a plethora of running clubs now. I mean, they're multiplying by the month. Mm-hmm. Why not connect directly with someone from a running club in that city you're going to and say, hey, my name's Tina and I'm coming in for a week. I got a long run scheduled. Would you be open to giving me a suggested route? Great. And I think you'd be surprised how often they get back to you. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, like you go back to that community that we have of runners. We want to help each other. Mm-hmm. So if they have a traveler coming in, they will probably get, they will exceed your expectations any three different routes. Yeah. Okay, great. Very helpful. Actually, that's funny you mentioned that because uh, a few weeks ago we had uh, Perry New- Newburn, who uh, is part of uh, Moon Joggers, and he talked. He did a, a run across the U.S. for his 60th birthday, and mm. I think I think it was 51 days. But anyway, oh. he was talking about how um, amazing the running community is for. Uh, you know, he would be running at 3 a.m. for 10 miles, <laughs> and he would have like five different people <laughs> joining him. And so for him, you know, he's that kind of brought it home of just how special this is and, you know, how much runners want to help other runners. So that says that even more from you. Yeah. And then what about other things like uh, any other things you've learned about, um, you know, how to find healthy restaurants or how to know where to look for food or you know, um, if you do want to, you know, get out of the hotel for a few hours, but you don't want to, you know, walk too far, other like runner friendly things for a location, what have you found? Every city has them. You just got to find them. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the, that's the opportunity right now, um, is for our hotels to expand the information we give out Mm -hmm. so that I believe is in the works, uh, where you almost get a cheat sheet. Oh, great. Um, we just practiced it at one of our hotels for up in Portland, Oregon. So we have six pillars of wellness, move well, eat well, feel well, play well. And I asked the hotel to put together an activity or two for each one. So give me three eat well places that were within three blocks of you guys that a runner or health minded individual would appreciate. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what's next. Okay. Because I don't think there's that many great, universal sources out there online that would answer that specific question that if I'm going to go to Kentucky and I'm hey, staying why at, are you picking on my because state? Because you know that's where you are. No, it's okay. And if I go to a hotel <laughs> in Kentucky and I want an answer to that question, I want somewhere good to eat, I mm-hmm. want a cool trail, I want a good place for mm-hmm. yoga, mm-hmm. whatever it is, that website doesn't exist right no, now. No, 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 it doesn't. So if our hotel can help facilitate that, Mm-hmm. And almost be like the Michelin book. Like we endorse this yoga studio. Yeah. We endorse this juicery. We're making the lives easier, a lot, uh, a lot easier for our guests. Yeah. Oh, that's so, great. Very it's in the works. So you're ahead of your time, Tina, with that question. Yeah. Actually, you know what? About five years ago, I was thinking to myself that I was going to set up a website because when I was traveling, just for a fa- uh, I think I was helping my sister-in-law move, and uh, I was in some random town in uh, Mississippi, and I thought you know what, I'm going to make a website where I write down every every place I go and where to eat, where to run. And 
I thought, oh, I'll do it in a few years. And now I wish I'd jumped on <laughs> yeah. it because I probably would have had back a- and look. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, when I go back to, I repeat cities all the time now, mm-hmm. and I know exactly where I'm going. I have it written down. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a matter of now being the run concierge and giving out the information in a cool way. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's cool. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And so, you know, you said about how much is this, this has taken off, but did you ever envision when you got this job that it would kind of snowball the way it has with you becoming, you know, this like, nucleus of information where people go to for help with all kinds of things and you know just the way it's grown around you and your community no in fact i actually hated the word concierge i thought it was stupid um i thought run concierge sounded so weird like Mm -hmm. what does that even what does it mean what (laughs) what does that mean right that's the question what does a run concierge mean and it wasn't until probably a year and a half in that i was like oh 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 I understand now. So, and because I got to know concierges and really understand what their job was. So I, I still, I'm not fully committed to that word run concierge. I think it's expanded more to wellness concierge and that's more encompassing of what I'm noticing on the road uh, and what I'm trying to give to not just runners, but our guests all the, on a frequent basis. But by no means uh, did I expect in, you know, three years ago to, to learn this much. I, I think I came in thinking I knew a lot about running and people, uh, and I wasn't even close. Mm-hmm. Um, I've met thousands upon thousands of runners, and I, I, it, you can learn something from every single person you meet mm-hmm. if you ask the right question. And what is one of your favorite questions to ask? Uh, it's not so much the question I ask. Mm-hmm. Ask? I just used your accent right there. <laughs> It is understanding who the runner is that you're talking to. What um, their reasons are. What their reasons are. Mm-hmm. And you can usually tell what type of runner they are by what they're wearing mm-hmm. and some of the things they say. Um, so you can tell if someone's been running for one to five years, six to ten, mm-hmm. or ten plus. And that's fun. We should play a game with you at some point where we, we show you pictures of people and you say, we sh- we get we should get the audience uh, <laughs> to send a picture and say tell me about myself and see how much you can get. I you know, but I, I'm also not judgmental. I mean, that's mm. the other thing. You can never judge a book by its cover. No, no. Um, I've learned that pretty well too. Mm-hmm. I've talked to some runners where I start asking questions about what their goals are, and they'll say, you know, I'm trying to like go sub two forty, and I'm like, you you want the full? And they, they say, yeah, and they're the most unassuming <laughs> sub-240 marathon you've ever met. I'm like, oh, I made the mistake again. Uh, that I just And they just blow you away with their work ethic and their drive. Mm-hmm. And that's why they're running sub-240. Yeah, but that's how it should be with running about, you know, it, it shouldn't matter. And I tell people this all the time. The number one thing people say to me more than anything is when they come up to me and they find out I'm a runner, they say, well, I'm not fast like you, but, and I'm like, stop, take, stop saying that. Just everyone, worst. everyone it's, out there is, is doing the same thing and it, it doesn't matter really. So, did um, you by any chance, um, read my story when I ran with Meb in Mammoth? No, I did so not. I so with, yeah, like, share, share with us. For I, sure. It's real fast. Cause it just goes to that point specific. And we're talking about Meb, we're the greatest marathon of potentially of all time. And he let me join him for a training run in Mammoth, an easy run for <laughs> Meb. And I was like, what's easy? He's like, oh, you know, 630, 640 for 10. And I was like, all right, that's in my wheelhouse. I mean, I'd be, it was not easy for me, but <laughs> um, needless to say, I lasted two miles with him and the altitude just smoked me. And at the end, I'm bashing myself, verbally bashing myself. Oh my God, I'm, I'm such a hack. I can't believe I thought I could run with you, blah, blah, blah. And Meb had just finally, he, he had enough. He's like, Chris, I used to run this loop six minute flat on the dot sub six is no problem now it's six thirty six forties you do the best you can today no oh, that's that. all it comes down to I did you do that. the best you could today i said yes i did he's like i did too mm-hmm. let's go do some drills mm-hmm. and i think it's so easy for us to call ourselves hacks and to beat ourselves up emotionally when we're out there running and trying the best we can and it, it does our it does a huge disservice to our who we are as people and as runners um so that is one of the bigger things I push out to runners on property when they do that. Well, I'm not fast. I'd like to go sub 230. I'm like, why are you doing that to yourself? Why would you say that first sentence? What what does that even do for you that's positive? You're trying to go sub 230. Give it the best you can. And if you don't, then it wasn't your day. Get it next time. 
But to put yourself in a box of I'm not fast does no good for anybody. Absolutely. Could not agree more. Thank you very much. And everyone listening, that is very good words of wisdom there. So Mm -hmm. take that in. Um, So then let's just kind of talk a bit more about, um, you know, it's clear that you're very passionate about running and you're very passionate about our community. But what is it about running that you love just so much, like more than other sports? Uh, I think, I don't know how you are as a runner, but um, there'll be times when my wife says, just go out and go, go for your run. <laughs> um, it is my, my time to myself. It is my time to compose my thoughts and to get out the energy that we are born with. Mm-hmm. And that when we wake up, we have that angst to move. That's one aspect of it. Um, but without a, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, running has helped shape who I am. It doesn't make me who I am, but it has certainly helped me better understand what's important to me and the importance of work ethic and setting goals. I mean, it's been 20 years now and not a single run has gone by where I've said that sucked or I'm not better because of that run. I, I it's a phenomenon. It's a lifestyle, it's not a hobby anymore. And it's now my, my job, uh, which I never expected. And that's it. I mean, the best ideas come when you're running me. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I was, uh, I was, I always come back. I try and make like a sentence of all the things I need to remember to do that I remembered on my run. Like, um, I need to Instagram my training, but not about Erin, who's a friend because blah, blah, blah. Like whatever that, like each word, like, uh, need Instagram training. Yeah. Yeah. You get one word. (laughs) Like it means, means each thing to remind me of. So yeah. And actually, uh, Dave McGillivray, uh, was one of the first interviews I did. He Uh, talked about how he would take a video, um, a dictaphone, uh, what's it called? Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. With him on a run so that he could like talk into it. And that's, I thought that was genius. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) And I, I, I don't know about you, um, but the more I run, yes, I, I really, I value my time by myself. But there's also something really special about running with someone new for the first time. Yeah. Uh, that is a shared experience that you will never get again. And the more I run, the more I want those. Uh, I yeah. like to run with people who either I admire, I've never met before, and that's what I'd rather do. So <laughs> six, six weeks ago, um, I was supposed to meet with Joni Benoit for a cup of coffee. And I was like, when, you know. What are the chances mm-hmm. she goes for a run instead? So I emailed her and said, I'll drive up to you you're two hours away. And would you mind going for a run instead of that coffee? Absolutely. We'll do eight to 10. I was like, yes. We <laughs> turned it to 13 miles with Joni Benoit Samus and the legend of wow. legends. And I will never forget that for as long as I live, that I just shared 13 miles with the pioneer of women's running. And she exceeded every expectation of what I thought she'd be oh. in person. She took me to her garden afterwards and starts picking kale for me and <laughs> cabbage. And it, it reminds me afterwards that she's just a regular person. Yeah. So what we talked about in the beginning before we even started this interview, that we're all just people. Mm-hmm. But when you run with someone, you share that sweat with someone. You get to know them a little bit better. Um, Absolutely. Tish Hamilton, you know Tish from Runner's World? Uh, no. She gave me one line that I've always believed in ever since she was able to put a, a word on it. That when you share a run with someone, you're more likely to open up to them. Because you're not looking them in the eye, number mm-hmm. one, and you're throwing it out into the wind. Oh. So it's almost a sacred space when you're with someone on a run. And you might say something to a runner you've never run with and you don't even know that well. You've never said it aloud before. You don't know why you just said it. It could be because the endorphins are really strong. It could be because you're not looking the person in the eye and you just trust them. But that, that you, you can't replicate. Yeah. No, that that's so true, and 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 you know it it is very important, and it is something that we do very uh, very often. Now I think about it, actually, you know, tell people things, and I tend to be too honest with things anyway, but especially <laughs> so on a run. Um, but uh, no, that's great, and so you know, I think it was on your video for the um, uh, when you were showing the video for Run Western on the website, you talked about uh, you know strength in numbers and how running is, you know, an individual sport, but we band together. So do you want to maybe just one more thing, just kind of uh, about the community, why we're so yeah. strong as a group when we're in such an individual sport? Sure. Yeah. The, the line was running is a solitary sport, but strength is in our numbers. So it, I think the beauty of that is actually a humility aspect that 
we train for 12 to 16 weeks for these marathons. And you look at Chicago and New York are coming up. And what's amazing when you, the runners, step into that corral is that you look at the people around you, the thousands and thousands of people there, and you realize that they've all been doing the same thing you have. And you can forget that when you're out there on these 45, 50 mile weeks, plugging away and slogging in these miles. And sometimes you never see anybody else out there. You think you're the only person training. And it's not till race day that you look beside you and there's a unique camaraderie that, that exists. And that adrenaline is what makes you go out the race too fast. <laughs> um, but it's also what makes it so special. And yeah. that is, that's precisely what I mean, is that, yeah. yes, this is a solitary sport per se. But if you really want to be a stronger person and a stronger runner, I actually encourage you to get out there more and train with groups as much as you can. Okay, great. And, and very true. And, you know something I would definitely agree with as much as you can run with other people. If this hasn't given you more reasons, you know, to do that, this is the time to do it. And, um, if you need more, you know, more than what we've already shared, um, there was an episode I'll put in the link in the show notes, uh, to black girls run mm. the interview with Tony, Tony and Ashley, and they were great. And they kind of talked about the same thing and how to feel included. And they've built this whole, you know, business around making everyone feel included. So, um, I'll put a link in the show notes, which I guess I'll mention now at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC132. So one other thing I want to ask you about before we um, go into the final kick round is you ran a marathon in a banana suit with oh, your brother. Jeez, you. Yes. I'm a stalker. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> yeah, I was watching from the sidelines. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Um, what made you decide to do it? And... <laughs> You know, tell us about that experience. We got a free year of Jamba Juice for that. <laughs> wow, that's, that's actually worth it. it. Okay, like, I think I, I think I, I think can do that. 2002, probably. You know, we were both in decent shape. Did uh, you know you were going to get it before, or this was like a con- costume competition? No, so I, I lived in Hermosa Beach at the time, you know, about two mm-hmm. hours north of San Diego. My brother John was in San Diego. I said, hey, dude, I got this, uh, you know, buddy who asked me to run in a banana suit for Jamba Juice. It's going to be a dozen bananas. Uh, I'm getting a free year. <laughs> I'm getting a free year of Jamba Juice. You want to do it? I was like, yeah. Uh, so I was like the twelfth banana, and this was before. Like, I don't know if you looked at the banana suit. That thing was pretty big. It wasn't yeah. like that little. They they've shrunk since 2002. <laughs> Banana's hot. So we got we got down there, and I remember getting that suit. I was like, dude, this is going to be hot. Like this this is no this is this isn't going to be easy. But we also were like, let's make sure we're the first two bananas to finish. So we did. We finished. We were the first two bananas to finish. Um, the two highlights of the race were we bumped into Bill Walton, the oh. legendary bass, who is still taller than us, in our <laughs> banana suits, which was amazing. Because the first time we ran by him, he was in like a Grateful Dead tie-dye shirt. And you hear from the sidelines in Bill Walton's voice, hey, hey bananas. And we look over like, oh, my God, it's Bill Walton. We should have gotten the picture. And this was before phones, too, really. You know, no one had like an iPhone. But my brother had one of those, like, Kodak, you know, disposable oh, yeah. ones. So we saw him again on the course, and we got a Kodak disposable picture with Bill Walton, which we cherished that picture. And then oh, the other thing good. is we both lost, I think, about 12 to 15 pounds that day. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I was going to um, – well, firstly, uh, once I was running, actually, Rock and Roll, ah, BC. There you go. Um, and uh, Spider-Man was near me. Was it and Michael Wardian? It, it, it was Michael <laughs> Wardian. I didn't know who he was at the time, but all I kept hearing was, go on, Spider-Man. So this whole time I was like, okay, pretend you're Spider-Man. Pretend they're cheering for you. Because I couldn't believe how many people were like, go on, Spider-Man. And then, yeah, later find out, as I interview him on here, that it was Mike Wardian. Yeah. And we discovered it while we were recording a podcast. the podcast. That's he was amazing. like, wait, was that you? Oh, that was. I knew there was a girl. And so it was kind He's of funny. Fat. But, he was a fast yeah. Spider-Man. He is a fast Spider-Man. Um, but, okay, so my actual question was just, you said how much weight you lost, but just how much harder was it to run in a costume or did the amount of cheering you got from the crowd, like I just mentioned with Mike and Spider-Man, did that kind of balance out the discomfort? Yeah. Like, how much harder was it? Not that much harder. Okay. And, you know, it, it's, it definitely made it a little hotter, but after seven or eight, eight miles, the body acclimated to it. And the other aspect of it that was kind of funny is that people don't want to get passed by a banana. <laughs> you can't forget yeah. that. You don't want to get passed by Spider-Man. You don't want to get passed by 
a stupid Jamba Juice banana. So that was also encouraging. You got lots of people sprinting away That was funny. Time. And then, you know, when you eventually pass them, you give them that little look like, sorry, bro, but I got to go, you know, and, and passing people as a banana was kind of fun. So you just got a glimpse right there into how it feels being a woman. Because Why? that's my biggest pet peeve is when men do that to me when I try and pass them. Oh, God. They sprint off. And, and so you that's still get exactly them, what it's you're like. Fast. You get them. Uh, but I, yeah, they exactly like what you said. They'll sprint off, but then I'll come past them again and be like, sorry, dude. Yeah. I'm going. Exactly. I think, yeah. no, see, I, I, look, I'll never know what it's like to be a woman. <laughs> um, but I found that to be inspiring. I was mm. like, you're an idiot. Like, you just surged against the banana <laughs> at mile 12. Yeah. This isn't 26. I'll see you in about a mile. Like, yeah, that was a yeah. stupid move on your part. Yeah. Your pride got the better of you. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I say to myself. So exactly. there's a lot of parallels with this. Yeah, this is funny. Yeah. And so would you encourage people to do that, like, just once to run <laughs> in a costume? Like whatever it is or is that something that, you know, you just did it for the Jamba Juice? I did it for the Jamba Juice, but... <laughs> I, I before I encourage them to run in a banana suit, I'd encourage them to dedicate six to nine months to to really specifically train for a PR. Okay. That's what I would encourage first and foremost. There's okay. there's nothing wrong with finishing a marathon. I think it's fantastic. Um, but you you learn a lot about yourself, re, re, regardless if you hit your goal of six to nine months of dedicated training for one race. Love that. And I could not agree more. That's that's good for me to... Although, can I ask your your um, permission that I would like to at some point do a Disney marathon uh, just to do it? My permission? Yeah, because you're saying about training hard and I train hard, but I someday no. want to do a yeah. Disney. Balance. A silly one. Balance, balance. Yeah. You right. get that one race you went for it, and then you say, all right, I need two years to go be Princess Leia in Disney, <laughs> and I'm going to go run uh, Arkansas as a Razorback. So there yeah. you go. There you go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> all right. We are just going to take a minute to thank our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with the final kick round. Thank you to Saucony for sponsoring this podcast. Saucony is the favorite brand of runners everywhere. Now, I might be a little biased, but I absolutely love their running apparel, accessories, and of course, shoes. I've been running in Saucony for almost three years, and I love the brand like a friend. They don't just make fun clothes and shoes in beautiful colors, or cool colors for my male listeners, but this is a brand that actually cares about us as runners, not lumping us in with other sports. Saucony truly puts the time and effort into thinking what we actually want and need, and to me, that means a lot. My favorite shoes are the Saucony Ride for training runs and the Saucony Fast Twitch for workouts and races. And I've also been trying out the new Freedom ISO they have coming out in December. It's been getting a lot of buzz, and I can definitely see why. They're awesome. Get 10% off at Saucony.com by using coupon code TINA. Just don't get mad at me if you can't stop buying things on the website. I know I want it all, and I'm sure you will too. Thanks to Body Health for sponsoring this podcast. So what is Body Health, you ask? Well, as you probably know, the food and supplement industry is kind of corrupt, and it can be so overwhelming to find products that will not cause us to grow an extra arm in 10 years. I'm joking, of course, but you know what I mean, right? It's hard to know who to trust. Well, I can give you one company who can be trusted, and that's Body Health. Their products are not only going to help you recover and therefore improve as a runner, but their motto of optimizing health and vitality is what they truly believe in. I take 5 to 10 of their perfect amino tablets every single day, and it's made a huge difference to my recovery time. If you don't believe me, listen to this. Your body can only absorb and use 18% of the protein in whey and soy protein, and only 48% in eggs. But our bodies can use 99% of the protein in perfect amino. Impressive, right? You can enter to win a pack of six bottles by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health, or you can get 10% off using coupon code TINA10. Okay, Chris, just five more little questions for oh you. Um, so you may James have given part. one of your answers away earlier, uh, starting with the greatest advice you've ever received. Oh, uh, as a person? It, it can be whatever you like. Um... Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't Mebs. Um, oh, no, I was thinking about the, was it Tish? Tish what was, she said. yeah, that was advice. I think that was more of like an insight of okay. running. Um, the 
best advice I've ever read, and this is the one that I stick with, is from a book to be a better runner. Mm -hmm. And it, I might be paraphrasing, but it, it boils down to if you want to be a better runner, be a better person first. Oh, I love that. Very true. And what, what was the book? If you can it's, I'm almost positive it's to be a better runner. And the author's name is Martin. I will send you the author's yeah, name. Yeah, I can. I'll put a link in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. A must read. Okay, good. So then my next question, which might be the same answer, favorite uh, running book or blog other than your own? It was certainly not my own. Um, favorite running book? Uh, Bill Rogers Marathon Man. Okay. All right. That's actually the first time we've uh, had that one mentioned on here, which is uh, surprising. I love um, him. I think yeah. he's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Good, good choice. All right. Um, what would you like to tell a brand new runner? Yeah. That's tough, Tina. I gave you these questions before. I want to think about it. Um, <laughs> I like to think on the spot, not really rehearse uh, the answer. I would say welcome and okay. take your time. Yes, very important. Good, good, good advice there. All right, um, what is your pre-race meal when you do get to race? A Cliff Bar, mm -hmm. a banana, and a bagel. <laughs> Whenever you say banana now, I'm just going to imagine you <laughs> Someone. <laughs> Although the next time someone passes me in a race, I'm probably going to imagine them as a banana. There like, you go. Well, I'm the banana, I guess. Uh, yeah, you yeah. are the banana, you said. <laughs> but anyway, so a cliff bar, a banana. And a bagel. And a bagel. Okay, good. Very I'm kind of old school with diet stuff. I'm not, I'm not up to times with the beet juice and all that. But. Mm -hmm. You mean you don't want insect bars? Yeah, I don't do that. Um, <laughs> I found it works for me, and I'm a little uh, habitual in that regard. <laughs> Yeah. No, if it works, why why change it? <laughs> yeah. That's the number one rule we learn in marathons, right? Don't yes. change anything on race day. All right, and finally, favorite running product? Body glide. Okay, very, very important to yes. runners. <laughs> Learning okay. that the hard way after the first marathon training season. <laughs> I was a senior in college, I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> what can I do to prevent this pain right now yeah. and not make my nipples bleed? <laughs> And then body glide I found and there you go. Your life one. was changed forever. Without a doubt. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, that's all we have for today. Is there anything you've mentioned? Uh, Twitter is the best way to keep in touch with you. I will put links to all of your um, social media in addition to the um, Run Western website or well, the part of that website. Um, but anything else you want to mention to people listening right now? Oh, thank you, Tina. I think it's great what you're doing for the running community. And Thanks. you ask very, very nice questions. And um, thank you very, very much for having me on your show. Oh, no. Thanks for coming on. And it's been great to talk to you. And uh, we will talk again soon. Running can be a really lonely sport. But Chris brought up so many good points to remind us all that we're actually all here for one another. And just like this community right here, right now, as in you guys, we're all in that same running community and we need to learn to kind of lean on each other a bit more during those times we're struggling. We all know just how wonderful runners are and I know I appreciate each and every one of you, even if we haven't connected yet. Speaking of which, um, I would love to hear your feedback about this podcast through the 2016 Run to the Top survey. It'll only be available a few more weeks and if you leave your email on there, you will be getting a personal email from me so we can connect and I really look forward to getting to know you. You can find the, the podcast survey at runnersconnect.net forward slash listen. So next week we will be talking to a mystery guest, uh, one you do not know, well, unlikely to know, but trust me, you will want to tune in. This podcast episode is going to be a wedding gift to someone's fiance who brought her into the running world and it is the most beautiful story so tune in where we reveal and if you recently proposed to your new fiance maybe it could be you so thanks so much for